Is the extent of surgery different for a parathyroid adenoma versus parathyroid hyperplasia? I'm Dr. Bob Akhilaryan from Center for Advanced Parathyroid Surgery, and we're gonna discuss that today. We're gonna to talk about how parathyroid adenomas develop and hyperplasia, uh, how the disease progresses, what the surgical steps are, and what needs to be done after surgery, and we'll compare the two. All right, so let's get going. The parathyroids are doing a lot of work. They're looking at the level of calcium in your bloodstream and when your calcium is below what it should be, they produce parathyroid hormone, which goes to your bones and tells your bones to release calcium into the bloodstream. Just like this little animation shows, PTH goes to the bones and tells them to release. And when the calcium levels go up, the parathyroid hormone levels come down. So there's always an intricate balance between the two. When you have a tumor developing a parathyroid adenoma, that's because one parathyroid gland develops a mutation in it that changes the level of calcium that it wants. So instead of being here, it wants it to be much higher. And this gland starts overworking and in time duplicates and becomes bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until it becomes a tumor and on the edge of it, you have a little rim of normal parathyroid. So when that process happens, as the normal parathyroids are affected by a parathyroid tumor, the tumor hijacks the system and produces an immense amount of PTH. The normal par parathyroids that are not working shrivel up and become smaller, producing very little parathyroid, but they're still working, doing a little bit of work. So in order to figure out if someone has hyperparathyroidism, you have to get blood tests. And the, most, the three most important blood tests are calcium, intact PTH, parathyroid hormone, and vitamin D. And by looking at the pattern of behavior between these three elements, you can tell if someone has hyperparathyroidism or not. Most importantly, this has to be done at eight o'clock in the morning and fasting. So eating and the time of day doesn't influence the PTH level. So a patient who has uh, primary hyperparathyroidism caused by parathyroid adenoma. This is a 51-year-old postmenopausal woman who complains of fatigue, memory loss, increased anxiety and body aches, feels like she just got old all of a sudden, hasn't been able to work in a couple years, calcium is minimally elevated at 10.4, PTH is also slightly elevated at 75, vitamin D is in, in the normal range here, uh, and has a bone density that's in osteopenic range, not osteoporosis. I did an ultrasound in the office and found an enlarged parathyroid just inferior to the thyroid gland. So here's the thyroid gland and there is the parathyroid, clearly seen. Skin is at this level, the fatty level under, layer under the skin. This is a thin muscle layer between the skin and the parathyroid. So not too far away. In the past, before we had good imaging studies to find the parathyroids, what we used to do is go in there and try to find all four parathyroid glands during surgery, and then remove the biggest one, send it to the pathologist to tell us to, if this is a parathyroid gland or if it's abnormal. And sometimes they could and sometimes they couldn't. And there was a lot of guesswork. During that surgery, we were going in there trying to look not for four normal parathyroids, but rather one large parathyroid and three shriveled up smaller parathyroids. So not only are these parathyroids harder to find because they're smaller, they also have smaller blood vessels feeding them. So one blood vessel going in and one blood vessel coming out. And if in the process of finding these smaller parathyroids, by accident, one of the blood vessels got injured, that parathyroid would die. So there was a risk of damaging normal parathyroids during the surgery. And we were always worried about that. Now, as we had more experience, the chance would become less, but it still was always there. And so once PTH testing came into play, we had another tool to tell us what's going on. We didn't have to depend on our visual look at a parathyroid gland to try to guess if it's normal or abnormal. We didn't have to look at the amount of radiation it produced if we injected it with uh, some radioactive material. We could look at the physiology. Now, if you look here, what's happening is that an abnormal parathyroid is producing a lot of PTH and a normal parathyroid producing very little PTH. So if you take this one out and check your PTH level and see that it drops by a huge amount from 120 to about 22, 
right? Then you know that the remaining three glands are not overworking. They're not overfunctional. There is no need for you to go look at them, to visually inspect them. Physiologically, they know, you know that they're not overactive. And that's really the key to this surgery. So what are the steps in this surgery? First, we make a small incision, usually about a centimeter and a half or to two centimeters. First thing you see after you make your incision is the muscle layer here, which you can see the borders of. Then you retract the muscle so you can see the thyroid gland. This is the thyroid gland, which is also what you see there. Then you retract the thyroid so you can get to see the nerve and the parathyroid. So here's the nerve, I'll draw it in black. And there is the parathyroid, the enlarged parathyroid. Now, if you should want to see the other parathyroid at the same time, if on ultrasound it looked potentially suspicious, you can easily dissect the nerve up and get to that other parathyroid. You check your PTH after you remove the parathyroid and cauterize that, the blood vessels that are feeding it. And at five, 10, and 15 minutes, I usually like to check PTH levels to see if the PTH levels dropped appropriately, more than 50% and into the normal range. If they have, then I know the remaining three parathyroids are not overactive and I don't need to even look for them or potentially harm them. The surgery's done. I know that I've been successful and the patient can go home easily. Um, and you can see in this case, the ultrasound really clearly showed the parathyroid that says sh same sh size and dimensions, right? Once the parathyroid is out and the PTH is down, I put one suture to bring the muscles together and two layers of sutures under the skin to bring the skin together. And then I'll put a little tape called a steri strip and that tape keeps the area safe and secure and the person can shower with that on the next day. I always put my patients on calcium PTA, I'm sorry, calcium and vitamin D supplements as well as magnesium, which helps stabilize the calcium. I, I try to have patients use Arnica and bromelain because it helps decrease the bruising and swelling faster. And there's no hospitalization certain necessary for this type of surgery. This particular patient had improvement of body aches pretty much immediately in the recovery room. The other symptoms took some time. And as you can see over time, the calcium level dropped dramatically at one month. And I always check calcium and PTH at one month and six months at a minimum. Sometimes I check it even more frequently. And then the PTH level did drop, but not as much. And that's because there is a battle between the bones and the parathyroids because the bones try to grab the calcium deficit back. So the parathyroid has to work hard sometimes to compensate for that. And over the six month period, everything kind of normalizes and balances out. Now, in terms of hyperplasia, this is a 38 year old man, complains of fatigue, weakness, memory loss, poor sleep, increased anxiety and body aches, feels out of control, feels like he's not in control of his body. This is a terrible symptom, right? has been having symptoms for years and years, had grandparents who were untreated for high calcium levels, aunt and uncle who had kidney stones. So it seems like there was a family history for him. Calciums were elevated, 10.6, not dramatic. And usually with hyperplasia, the elevations are not dramatic unless it's caused by kidney failure. PTHs are also not usually not dramatically high. Um, on ultrasound and sesame B, no enlarged parathyroid was found. On 4D CT scan, there was a suggestion that two of the parathyroids were enlarged. So we didn't know if we were dealing with a double adenoma or hyperplasia. So during uh, surgery, you have to make an assessment. So hyperplasia can happen in symmetric hyperplasia, which is rare, where all four are equally enlarged. Most often what you have is what we call asymmetric hyperplasia, where there are different sizes, and you can see it here four different abnormal glands, all differing in sizes. Because hyperplasia means all of the parathyroid cells in all of the parathyroid glands are abnormal. So over time, they start growing, duplicating, having more mutations, which causes some of them to grow faster, some of them grow slower, some produce more PTH and so on. And the treatment, in the past, the treatment used to be to take out all four parathyroids and take one of them, cut it in half and implant it in your forearm right? Or in a muscle in your neck. The problem with that surgery was that 20% of the time when you implanted a parathyroid in a muscle, it didn't work. So 80% of people did well, 20% had no parathyroid function permanently. 
And that's, that's not something you would want. You don't want to replace one problem, hyperparathyroidism, with hypoparathyroidism. So then a lot of the expert surgeons decided to do three and a half gland removals, what we call subtotal parathyroidectomy, and that's great too. And some people even advocate removing three glands. The way I decide between those is the size of the smallest gland. So if the smallest gland is twice the size of a normal parathyroid, then I would cut it in half and remove half of it. On the other hand, if the remaining parathyroid is close in size to a normal parathyroid, then I would just remove a small portion or biopsy, just biopsy to confirm that that was the parathyroid that I saw. What we're essentially doing is reducing the number of abnormal cells in a patient who have parathyroid hyperplasia. We have to find all four glands and we have to reduce the size of the last smallest gland to what we estimate to be something that functions well for the person, but it's not over-functional. That way we can buy the most amount of time before that particular gland has a chance to grow large enough to get that person into trouble. Hopefully we've bought them a lifetime of uh, not having overactive parathyroids, right? But again, you are leaving a small portion of an abnormal parathyroid, which is okay, because you don't wanna make that person hypoparathyroid and make them be dependent on high doses of calcium and vitamin D and potentially even injections of PTH. If you were to look at it in a stepwise fashion and you had these four parathyroids, if you were to take out one parathyroid at the time, you can see the PTH levels are coming down gradually with each one until you get the last one out to smaller size, which you get a PTH of 21, right? And sometimes you may have to work in a stepwise fashion. So the steps include the same incision in the same location for hyperplasia and adenoma. Again, the next step is separating the, uh, finding the muscles, checking a PTH level right in the operating room, <clears throat> separating the muscles and looking at the thyroid, <clears throat> excuse me, going down deeper and retracting the thyroid so you can find the vocal cord nerve and then both of the parathyroids and then you look at these parathyroids assess the size of them and then you go to the opposite side find the nerve and the other two parathyroids and once you have that you look and see which one of those four parathyroids was the smallest in this particular case it's the right lower parathyroid in this person so remove the upper parathyroid the larger get a little biopsy on that smaller one because it's close to size and normal in this particular case. Remove the two on the left side, check PTH levels. And the PTH came down from the 80s to 24, 21, and 19. So the PTH levels came down and plateaued in, in the low normal level, which is exactly what you want. You want an appropriate drop, but you want to know that the remaining parathyroid is functioning adequately for you to work. If it functions less, then you re-implant a portion of the parathyroid in there. If it's doing more, if the PTH didn't come down 50%, or if it's, you know, you start at 80 and their PTH is 45, then you can cut it a little bit more and check PTHs again. So it gives you a lot of room. It takes more time, but it also gives you a better result. And this is an image of the three parathyroids that were removed in this patient. And two of them were much larger, which were the ones that were visible on the 4D CT scan. And this one, which is still abnormal, was not quite as large. Close the skin, the muscle the same way, the skin in the same way, the same kind of strips, and the post-operative care is the same. Putting the patients on calcium, vitamin D, magnesium, arnica and bromelain, which is optional. And this surgery can also be done without the patient needing to be hospitalized. They can go home the same day, which is always an advantage. With this particular patient, you can see the labs the drops were dramatic and over time the calcium drop and the PTH drop stabilized and looked uh, more even. Now the symptoms for this patient took longer to, to improve and the reason for that is that more than likely he had had this illness for many many more years than the other patient we presented with an adenoma. That is an important important difference uh, because the longer you have this illness the higher the difference between your calcium levels that naturally should be and the ill calcium levels, the longer it takes for you to heal and recover and rebalance. Hopefully this is all very helpful to you. If I can be of any further help, please don't hesitate to contact me at 
parathyroidmd.com. And if you like this video and if you think that it's helpful, please subscribe and like the video for us. Thank you kindly.